Uh-oh. If you thought it was hard for rookies to get into F1, it might just have gotten a little bit harder. The new boss of Alpha Tari, soon to be renamed Insert Your Name Here, Racing Balls, Insert Your Name Here, this is a cool spot, has been talking to the motorsport website RacingNews365.com and has said the old days of Toro Rosso are over. You know, the idea that two brand new junior drivers from the Red Bull stable could have a chance to learn the tricks and tools of Formula One and then maybe progress later on? No, we're not going to be getting that anymore. And it's all to do with uh, them needing to get money. Well, that program's kind of fallen flat on its face with the new CEO of Alpha Tauri. I'm just going to call them that for now because it's easier and we'll find out the new name in a couple of days when F1 releases their entry roster for 2024, declaring that the new team identity will be not that of a B team and will be thus him. I think we'll still try to fulfill one of the other strategic directives, which is to fulfill the junior development program, but we'll do it slightly differently. We will not race with two juniors. We will always have one experienced driver who will take one young driver under his wings and help him to develop. So what we saw in 2023, basically. Yeah, I think that's pretty much what Daniel Ricciardo's purpose is now at AlphaTauri. I think that's also what Nick DeVries' purpose was for AlphaTauri, because even though he was a rookie, he was in his late 20s and he did teach Yuki quite a lot of things, which he does hold with good grace even to this day. But having said that though, saying Yuki Tsunoda is a junior or a rookie driver is a complete misnomer now. I know Yuki is a very young person and he is very, very small, but he has been around Formula One for about three seasons now. He's going into his fourth season and four seasons in Formula One? That's not exactly a junior driver. Michael Schumacher was only in his third full season of Formula One when he was challenging for titles. Lewis Hamilton was challenging for the title in his rookie season. In 2022, Lando Norris was in his fourth season and nobody would have called him a junior driver. Max Verstappen in his full season? Well, um, yeah, well yeah, okay, he was dealing with quite a lot of things, including crashing a lot and the uh, moniker Crash Stappen, which came to a head in Monaco 2018. And thankfully, he was able to build up from there. That fourth season was a little bit rough. This whole idea of Yuki being a junior driver still is really confusing. They've got nearly a dozen of those and Yuki ain't one of them anymore. But when you read the article more and more, the penny drops. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, British bias. Um, how about... Centime uh, uh, d'euro. Bear has revealed the truth behind this move as well as many other ones we will discuss today shareholders. They have a lot more of a say than you think, and Alpine giving out more of the team to outside investors, which include celebrities, they will be having a lot of say in where that team goes. You mark my words. I think uh, Esty Besty, if he carries on being uh, who he is in 2024, he's going to be going full on war mode. Yeah, I think I think he's gone. But according to those shareholders, Bayer had said that the focus needs to shift from the junior stable mindset to that of being simply Competitive, which is basically the same motivation as every other team on the grid, so hardly groundbreaking. And also uh, to commercially balance the team. This just sounds so soulless. I thought the name change was bad. This is just even worse. There's no soul left in that team anymore. It's now trying to justify its existence as being part of the Red Bull group and uh, trying to make it worse as while and make sure that it's bringing money to the table with many other lucrative sponsors because quite a lot of sponsors are being mooted with this brand new team and Daniel Ricciardo being there is a really good example because you yeah, know, I'm, I'm Formula One smiley guy and uh, many sponsors like me. Come on Visa, uh, you go boss, Adidas, uh, come over here. Don't worry fellas, I I'm good. Because that's the idea for the naming rights. Everyone thinking that Racing Bulls, that's a really odd name. I think it's an okay name, it's not an inspiring name, but when you look at the overall idea to be competitive in Formula 1 and looking to commercially balance the team, it all makes sense now because my joke about insert your name here, I think it's ringing true because whoever gets the naming rights to that team with the term racing balls in the middle of it will make it sound like it's their team. And with Adidas or Hugo Boss being the title sponsor mooted for the brand new team, they could make it sound like Adidas Racing Bulls. So the people who work at Adidas or Adidas will go, this is our team, the Adidas Racing Bulls. Ooh, we sound great, this is our team. They can chest thump all they like. Meanwhile, the Fienza based team is doing all of the daily grunt work and then Adidas can go to their board saying, look at our team, it's doing really well. Daniel Ricciardo is really nice and uh, 
Yeah, it's our team. It's a dinner party or shareholder meeting topic, really. A title sponsor for a team like that could be tens of millions of dollars. And on top of the extra 20 million that Daniel Ricardo basically gifted them in Mexico from Haas, and money that that team really does need to uh, improve. I know, I know, I'm being harsh on the guy. He does have a lot of potential and he still has got good talent and racing skills as we saw in Mexico. And what we might have seen in Brazil had they not fallen foul of being a lap down bizarrely and them not sensing it and then the FIA being completely strict about it. Ugh, yeah, you just feel like it's a real mixed bag here, but he is a PR guy's dream. I thought the Aramco deal with Aston Martin was soulless. And another thing that the shareholders are looking for, which I find particularly abysmal, is this. Ahem. You're getting a twofer for this one. We shall maximize synergies with Red Bull Racing, the ones we are allowed to by the FIA in terms of parts. Using all the parts which we haven't done this year is something we consider as an error from the team. So that's something will definitely change for next year. The shareholders, they don't want us to win the world championship. I think it wouldn't be realistic, but they want us to fight clearly for P5. In order to achieve that, we will have to be a proper Formula One team. That's why we're investing in facilities. A proper Formula One team. So the last two decades have shown that you are not a proper Formula One team. That team has been responsible for many of the current drivers on the grid even being there. What does that say about your organization and how you view your own team? That's just, is really sad. And also, fighting for P5. And Aston Martin would be easily described right now as being the fifth best team. So you want your team to best Aston Martin. I think that's going to be tricky. I mean, Alpine might be reasonable. I mean, I think P6 or P7 is viable. I, I, I appreciate you're not going for the world championship. I just don't think fifth is realistic. You're only going to get disappointed, folks. I get it. In order to be competitive these days, you need to invest in new resources and materials and facilities, which is what Williams managed to get a little more leeway on with the CapEx increase, which was proportionally bigger for them and the lesser teams, which included Alpha Tauri. But the way that Peter Bayer is going through all of this alongside Christian Horner, it just feels incredibly soulless and disingenuous and going against the entire raison d'etre of the Red Bull group even having a second team. Because that model was incredibly efficient and I understand the model of going back to the old days of Toro Rosso where they did share parts with the senior team. In fact, they practically had the same car and you even saw that with the STR1 which ran a detuned Cosworth V10 with that weird airbox with that, that secondary little hole. It looked really silly. That model worked by getting loads of drivers on the grid and they, yes, did eventually move on to greater things or they dropped out of the sport because they weren't competitive enough or in the case of Pierre Gasly, they just left out of boredom. I just feel that if Dietrich Mateschitz was still around and not Oliver Minslav, he would be absolutely furious or he would not let this happen in the first place because he was a racing fan. He loved racing. Sure, he didn't get himself involved in the daily. He trusted other people to do that, but he was always keen to find out what was going on with the teams that he had given good money for. And it was just part of something he loved doing. And he was just happy to be part of that world. But now it's just They've got to justify keeping that team and not selling it off, even though Rodin Cullen did try to buy it out for nearly a billion dollars. It goes to show that that team is not exactly the minnows that it was in Minardi. They are worth a lot. They are worth more than the likes of Williams and Haas. They punch above their weight all the time. Minardi was around for decades because they were quite good at being resourceful and finding sponsors at the 11th hour. All these other teams would just run out of money or go out of business or have some kind of controversy. But Minardi just kept on chugging. Also in 2008, I find it really funny that thanks to Sebastian Vettel, I know that a lot of German and fans were calling me up about the pronunciation, managed to be higher in the constructors than the senior team. That was really funny and the only time that happened. But I thought the whole point of that team was a place where young drivers could quietly learn how Formula One worked without too much attention. They could quietly get on with things towards the back of the grid, no pressure to try and score points all the time, and ease themselves into the sport calmly, naturally, without too much pressure. Of course, the pressure would build if you're in your third season and you're still not performing, but for that first year and a bit, you were good. But now, no, because the Red Bull group have become much more ruthless later on as they have progressed, and uh, 
you are very lucky to even get a chance in Formula One. And nowadays with the pressure on rookies and the fact that rookies can barely get into the sport, you're lucky to even get one season without people calling for your head. What has become very clear in Bayer's mind is that the team needs to stand out on its own two feet and be a Formula One team in their own right and realise the full potential of the team, of the commercial side of it. Something of which in an interview with Planet F1 he deemed as lacking, whereas everything else was solid. He even said the facilities were fantastic. So okay, why are you saying then months later the facilities need investing in if they were already fantastic or good. And another thing that Bayer said, which he's gone against, is that he would keep the team as being the one that educated and developed young drivers. Well, it's going to be a lot harder and much less efficient to do so if one of those seats is being taken up by a guy who's pushing to be in one of the most senior positions within Formula One. Daniel Ricciardo is one of the oldest drivers on the grid. The entire junior program now, thanks to this new initiative, is going to be coming to a screeching halt. You might get a Red Bull junior driver in that team once every two or three years. And considering that it still nearly has a dozen young talents in there and Liam Lawson was snubbed a chance in 2024 despite his great subbing in for Daniel, means that I find the entire Red Bull initiative incredibly lacking and almost pointless. But you can easily tell from the language of Bayer is that instead of being committed to being the team that educated young drivers, now that directive is something that they are going to try and fulfill. Like, oh well, I suppose we'll try and fulfill one of the directives, but it's only one of many, so maybe if we don't, then it's no big deal, honestly. But what's stopping them from changing even that? They might completely ditch that entirely, because the hiring of Nick DeVries from last year in response to his impressive performance at Monza for Williams at the last minute was something that Helmut Marco saw and much like a magpie, Helmut Magpie was like, "Oh, I want that shiny thing, give it to me! And then he immediately got buyer's remorse. But the point was, is that he was prepared to look at a driver from the Mercedes camp and then put them in his team. It was clearly a mismatch. If you were part of the Red Bull Junior program and you saw that going on, you would have just been looking what have I got to do? Which leads me back to the other thing that they mentioned, synergy with Red Bull. As we've seen over this season, the team is starting to move back to the idea of borrowing parts or even hold cars from the senior team, which again is what they did for the first couple of Toro Rosso machines. The inclusion of the rear suspension from the RB19 and further enhancements from said outfit are the first steps towards the end goal, which is to effectively run a facsimile of the RB19 for 2024 as closely as possible to the regulatory limit. Probably something to like cut down on costs or something, and that means you don't have to provide so much R&D and wind tunnel time, and probably something to do since they now can no longer to develop the 2026 cars until January of 2025, and also the second team doesn't necessarily have to pay the outlay for developing parts in the first place. In fact, the way that AlphaTauri have been talking this year have gotten the FIA involved and having to re-clarify their position on the ideas of teams collaborating with each other and copying parts. Nicholas Tombasis, the effective boss of single-seaters for the FIA, was skirting around directly calling the team out, as he was constantly saying in a piece from Crash.net that he understood that Red Bull and Avatari got the most criticism based on their obvious relationship and history, but that they weren't being accused of anything right now. It felt like more it was just a fresh reminder, a friendly reminder to all teams that you better be careful because we don't tolerate this. But then in the same breath, Tom Bass has said that they couldn't monitor every single communication between teams, such as daily calls and Zoom calls with engineers from two teams about certain parts. So what's stopping the two teams just communicating with one another and saying, oh yeah, that part, write this down, okay, and uh, record the call, yeah, and then they can just take what they hear and go from there. Now, I know, I know, this is kind of conspiratorial, but it is still part of the model that Toro Rosso and Red Bull used to do. And of course, they have been talking about this out loud in the media, so this isn't a pontification point or the need for me to have a tinfoil hat on. So going back to my initial thoughts, what does this mean for driver progression? Well, to me, this means that I reckon that this kind of makes the path very clear for what the future of the rosters will be. I'm formulating my 2025 driver predictions here, is that Daniel Ricciardo is probably going to be quite safe in Formula 1, be it for Alpha Tauri or for Red Bull. He is going to be around for at least a couple of years. He'll either be partnering Max Verstappen in 2025, trying to give Red Bull a little bit more glory before the regulations change and everything goes up in the air again, or he will remain at AlphaTauri, being the educator to brand new drivers, or just sticking with Yuki Tsunoda because, you know, it works, so why change it? However, if Daniel does go up to the senior team, then who could replace him? That follows that brief. 
Well, I mean, loads of people would like to see Nico Hülkenberg in that team, but I think realistically, this could be another chance for Sergio Perez to remain in Formula 1 as an educator to brand new drivers, maybe Liam Lawson or Yuki Tsunoda as well, or maybe Yuki with his Honda connections goes to Aston Martin to replace Lance Stroll who might join the wet campaign if that goes through. But the question is though, would Checo do that? Would his pride allow him to do that? Well, that's up in the air right now and I've not really come up with my predictions yet. This is just my processing phase and me thinking, hmm, could that actually work? I mean, it could. Or since one of those seats is going to be dedicated to an experienced driver, it could also mean if Checo doesn't perform in the main team, there could be a driver swap. So uh, yeah. But at least there's a clearer solution as to where Checo could go for 2024 or 2025, I think. I can't fault the team for wanting to sustain themselves and adapt to the ever-changing world of Formula One. But the way they're going about it right now, to me, it just feels incredibly charmless, without character, sterile, like it's just a case of trying to justify their existence within the Red Bull camp and instead of just being there to educate young drivers, they are there as another opportunity to be a billboard for the team, try and make some extra money for the group, instead of just being sold off to the highest bidder. We could have seen Roden Carlin taking over the operation, we could maybe have seen Andretti taking over, it could have easily gone that way, Red Bull group, they could have easily gotten about a billion dollars or so, but no, they still wanted to keep the team. But but this still feels like a very half-hearted exercise almost, like they want to keep the team to maybe try and fulfill, as Bayer said, the original directive, or instead just be another opportunity for more sponsorship money because the Red Bull car is already kind of full and this probably might be a little bit cheaper for sponsors and Daniel Ricardo's there! So money and uh, all go all's good, no controversy. I don't think Alpha Tower is going to be as bad as they were in 2022 or the first half of 2023, but neither do I think they're going to be challenging the likes of Aston Martin as they are trying to achieve in the following season. Yes, they might have a much more developed car, they might have the hand-me-downs of the RB19 as close to the rules as they can allow, but I certainly feel like their ambitions are still a little bit too high. And I just feel really sad that the original mission statement for that team has just been lost. It's just become really clinical and sterile. It's just, it's just really hard to back that team anymore. Other than the fact I want to see Yuki Tsunoda thrive and have a good chance at getting that second seat alongside Max Verstappen and hopefully becoming the most successful Japanese driver in the entire history of Formula One. That to me feels like a much more poetic story rather than Daniel Ricciardo having remorse and then going scurrying back to the main team and then Christian Horner going <laughs> I just feel that team's purpose is to educate young drivers and see who can duke it out and survive. Much like the season we saw with Carlos Sainz and Max Verstappen in the same year of 2015. Which is why I think that Carlos leaving for pastures new in 2017 was the main catalyst behind the Red Bull Junior scheme completely falling to bits. You might want to watch this video next because that gives you the entire widget of my theories about said catastrophe.